What is often changed and modified on race cars to help improve the performance often makes its way into the world of customized cars, where it becomes more about the form and the style than the actual function. It's no different in the import car world, where racing techniques led to the sport of drifting and eventually to stance-style cars and the global phenomenon that we know as the tuner industry. This is the second part of the import car history. We kind of touched on the origins of it, you know, how they started coming over to the U.S. and, and what kind of was being done to help kind of make these into, you know, performance vehicles, but also kind of the styling that happened. And, you know, a lot of that then kind of led up to, to Hollywood ca trying to capture that, you know, with the first Fast and the Furious movie in uh, 2001. Yes, you're right. And... You know, the thing that really a lot of people look back on Fast One is it's not really the story about, you know, Dom Toretto or, or, or Brian Connor. It's about the orange Supra. Supra. Yeah. So it's also about like Dom's uh, Veilside RX-7 from the first one that shifts, I don't know how many times in 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, OK, let's talk about Brian's uh, uh, Eclipse, because, you know, yeah. again, Eclipse, that's the second generation Eclipse. And that was actually styled by a friend of ours, Robert Wilson mm -hmm. uh, from Modern Image. Modern. And uh, Robert had a uh, had basically a sticker business, you know, which at the time was a very popular thing to have. Well, it's yeah, hot routers were painting stuff, but you know, you're you're talking about an import car throwing on you know body kit or, or ground effects or something like that, and hey, just sticker it. That's right. Yeah, just throw some graphics on it and change them out if you don't like it this week. Go into another event, can put another graphic on. So that was very popular, and obviously back then, I was, the the other very hip thing to do was uh, people would actually put a roll call of all the different mods or the parts that you had yeah. on your car. You had like a list on the side of your car, basically almost like a contingency, like you'd well, see a NASCAR. Sponsor, yeah, that kind right. Of stuff, yeah. You know, and, and that was the whole thing. If you had an AEM cold air intake, you had an AEM sticker. If you had an HKS exhaust, you had, you know, an yeah. HKS, you know, sticker. Um, you know, and that's kind of how you'd let people know. Almost like a badge of honor, uh, you know, look at what I've got. Yeah. Um, which is kind of the opposite of most street racers that try to hide everything. Yeah, you don't want to know. What you don't want everybody to know, know, right? Hide in the NOS or something like yeah. that. But, and I think, too, that was, you know, it's part of that kind of style and that culture was it was showing it all off. You know, you, you had all these, these styling, you know, companies. Obviously, we, we talked a lot about the early years was the performance you know, right. of it or the, the handling with, you know, maybe you had Koenig shocks or, you know, you had KWs, you know, starting to come in, stuff like that. But um, the, the styling of it, was really something that they kind of took as their own, you know, versus like hot rod guys. I, and I think that's because again, like the Japanese models were very unique at that time. Mm -hmm. They had a very clean, almost like a aerodynamic look to them. Yeah. They weren't about having this, you know, stuff hanging off the cars or everything. So to them, body kits were just an extension to make the, the car obviously look lower but yeah. also handle better because you had better aerodynamics. Well, and a lot of that came, you know, like everything kind of comes from the racing world and that kind of inspiration yeah. to then take it a little bit to the next level, you know, for, for more appearance sake. So, you know, you talk about, you know, the Vail side, you know, RX-7, that was, you know, pretty pretty popular and famous in Fast and Furious. You know, they started out in, in the early 90s. And what's funny is is the guy that, was the designer there was kind of inspired by the old school Batmobile from the sixties. Right. You know, and they, uh, you know, in 94, they took, a, you know, their super combat, you know, designed to the Tokyo auto salon and they won. Yeah. You know, and, and so they started, you know, getting permission, you know, you know, had to get permission from the, the Japanese, you know, basically their department of transportation to sell a lot of these aftermarket parts. Sure. You know, if you weren't, Honda or Nissan, you had to get permission to do it. Right. And, um, but yeah, they got permission to start selling the aero parts and they would replace everything on the car. Yeah. You know, we're talking doors, hood, fenders, everything except for the roof basically would be completely restyled. Right. Um, you know, and then that kind of helped kind of inspire a lot of people in the U S you know, like wings West they were, they were a little more toned down where they weren't replacing every single body panel. Cause probably the guys in the U S were like, I, I just bought this. I'm yeah. not going to redo everything. Right. I'm already standing out, you know, as, as enough as it is. So, you know, you had spoilers, you know, rear wings, you had bumper, you know, front bumpers, front splitters, stuff like that, you know, or yeah. hood scoops that, 
you know, they started to kind of introduce and, and, and Ernie and, and, and Scotty over there at wings West, they did a great job of being ahead of the curve. Yeah. They looked at what was going on in, in, in other parts of the world, not mm-hmm. just Japan, but they were looking at what's going on in Germany. Yeah. Europe, they, yep. All the European stuff, because I mean, obviously Scotty with, you know, Scotty's the guy that actually owned the white Jetta that Jesse drives in fast one. Mm-hmm. Um, that was his personal car. I yeah. mean, that was something that he was into that. So, um, but also Tim, but also then spoilers, they got a little out of control here. A little bit of the Japanese style came to the States well, because for a while we did call them shopping cart handles. Yeah. You know, there was a little bit of a kind of a weirdness going on. Well, and, and what's interesting with that, there is a, a certain style in Japan. Um, you know, you had the, the street racers were also, you know, like they were here kind of originally a little bit of the outlaws and there's a certain style called uh, Bosuzoku in Japan that is basically what's funny is they called it like how they would drive would be called Yankee style. So they would be doing really carving. They would be, you know, drifting. They would be getting wild. They, they would usually like, you know, straight pipe their cars. Yeah. They would put the huge wings on it. They were look at me. I yes. want attention. Yes. They were the young kids kind of, you know, creating that. And, and, and that's they're almost what that cartoonish, was right? Well, and then, yeah, you look at where adi- initial D happened with the manga, anime, that yeah. kind of style. That kind of bled into it as well. So, you know, there was that style over there, but it was more on purpose. Yeah. Whereas here it was like, oh, I'm cool. But like, no, you're, it's, it's like you either got to own it and go crazy with it right. and have fun with it or make it nice and make it stylish. But yeah, you, you're going to get a little bit of everything, you know, no matter what's happening. And, and, uh, you know, with Fast and Furious, with the popularity of that, um, you know, you started to see obviously that kind of expand in all those businesses. And obviously there's people that are going to take it kind of just, just crazy. Well, um, let's look at rocket bunny or even Liberty walk. Yeah. You know, we we're looking and those guys were inspired by obviously what was going on in the nineties, but mm-hmm. we still look today. I mean, you go walk the Toyo Tires tread path at SEMA yeah. every year for the last, I don't know, 10 or 15 years yeah. now. And there's always top quality cars that are done in a lot of these different import styles. Mm-hmm. Th- even throughout the years. That's what I love about that, too. Sometimes it's a throwback. Sometimes it's today's deal. Yeah. Um, I like how there's usually a unique, unique car or even a unique styling. With Look at last year. They had a Ferrari that had a K motor in it. No, and that's, <laughs> I mean, that's the thing, too. We talk about, you know, Liberty Walk with, you know, Wataru Kato. He kind of there the the classic you know talking about the little fiberglass like BRE little fender flares yeah well he kind of took that and then just worked off of that so you know it wasn't like go crazy or go this and that it was just kind of sleeking everything out sure and so that's you know in my opinion like a lot of the Liberty Walk Rocket Bunny those body kits are like better than the factory because yes it's it's very tasteful yes it's you know kind of done correctly but but he applied that not only to you know the the hondas and the nissans but okay hey i'm gonna go put a body kit on an f40 ferrari yeah or a lamborghini or a supra right you know the stuff like that and kind of just go with it it. well and and what i love about that is everything's on the table Mm -hmm. there is no taboo if you're gonna body kit a lambo bam show me yeah. Right. Um, and also, too, that's led over to let's look at the RWB styling where we're taking a Porsche. Yeah. So and applying more of a, a European car, European car mm-hmm. through and through. And let's apply more of a Japanese style, which, again, too, they're lending from the GT classes from IMSA and, and yeah. SCCA. Well, that's that's you, really you look from. at even some of the yeah the Japanese yeah. race cars of that time. They they do look like. The IMSA cars, you large know, basically box it's just flares and, yeah, you know, it's race car, it's race car, it's race car stuff, right, right. You know, um, because of race car, <laughs> hey, because race car right? <laughs> um, but, and, and, you know, it's funny kind of going back to fast and furious. You're talking about how a lot of the cars in there weren't just built for fast and the furious. They were already existing cars that yeah. they would borrow and, and grab and stuff like that. Um, I looked up, they, in the fast one, 78 cars were wrecked. Yes either on screen or off screen. Yes. You know, so you're talking, you're going through a lot of cars there, but you know, they were also calling the guys like, you know, RJ or, or Craig, you know, Lieberman. Yeah. Like, hey, bring your guys out. We need a bunch of background cars yeah. and stuff like that. And everybody showed up. They did. And, and that was something too, that I, I can clearly remember that where it was get everybody together. Let's all get down to the port. 
Mm-hmm. And that obviously is the meetup scene that we see, um, you know, where they, where, yeah. where they kind of basically call out the race. Um, but yeah, that, that's an actual, that was a spot that a lot of us would meet up at because that's an LA Harbor. Uh, it's warehouse one. Um, mm-hmm. and it's the easiest place to meet up to then try to get a race to take you back into the Harbor where there's not a lot of cars. So that's where drag racing, yeah. you could go street race basically in the Harbor area. So that was a known spot. Um, all of us, you know, when you just say, Hey, meet us at warehouse one, boom. Yeah. Everyone knew, you know, so that, that was, that was a huge thing. And that too, that was, boy, I think it started at like five o'clock at night and most people got home about five in the morning. So it was an all night deal. Yeah. No, I mean, it was a, yeah, it was a popular thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're, we're talking with, you know, fast and furious, um, because fast one we're talking i mean craig's we, we got to talk more about craig yeah, yeah craig puts everything together too so no and so yeah obviously so fast one they were, were kind of bringing together all the california kind of you know import car scene right um and they obviously you know like we said before they reached out to the people that knew what they were doing yeah. that were already in it to to kind of make it happen you know craig lieberman's pretty much the car wrangler that put most of this together for fast one. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, he was a guy that was in the import scene. That was more of a show guy. Um, You know, he had a couple different cars that he showed off. Obviously he had a Supra. Um, And that was really kind of the producers at the time. They'd walked around a bunch of different shows and they met up with Craig and Craig was very, had a lot of information to pass over. Yeah. The producers were going to all these import car shows to try to, you know, they're taking pictures of the cars like, okay, let's yeah. talk to this guy. Let's get that one in. They were, you know, doing their research. And, and Craig was the guy on the know. So for them, like when they met him, I think that might have just been by chance. You yeah. know, just walk just up, start around. talking what to somebody doing? and what yeah. are you doing? And But Craig was the 411 information book. He was the guy that he can say, oh, I'll, I'll get, you know, you want me to do an event at Warehouse One, to, you know, tomorrow night? I'll have 500 cars there. Mm-hmm. Craig was that guy. Yeah. You know, so hats off to him. No, and he's they, a big part of that movie, too. I mean, obviously, from even the cars that were picked on the movie, he had a lot to do with that. Um, the styling of it, you know, he would even tell people, like, no, we wouldn't do that. And yeah. Rob Cohn listened to him. That was another thing, too. A, a yeah, lot you got to have the, you know, for Hollywood or something, you got to have the people that are willing to listen to yeah. the people that are legitimate within that to, to make it happen. Whereas, and that's the thing, too, you know, with Fast and the Furious, it has deviated quite heavily well, from totally. being true to a car scene, you know, much later on. Right. Um, but they, you know, in the early years, they, they really did look at and try to emulate what was happening. Cause you know, talk about race wars that was happening yeah. in the movie. You know, that was a, a direct basic influence, you know, from the import car world. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's basically battle the imports. They couldn't use the name. Yeah. Right. So race wars, race wars, real simple, you yeah. know? And then, yeah, I think they were even going to think about calling the movie that, yeah, you know, yeah. at some point. But, yeah, um, but no, and so yeah, the Fast and Furious kind of kept going. They start, you know, obviously we're making sequels. You know, and, and some of them started to get, you know, they started making sequels, and you know, you get to like Fast Five, and it kind of went off the rails. It was okay. This is now a Hollywood action movie yeah. franchise. We're gonna go into outer space. Right. We're going to jump cars through buildings. Yeah. You know, we're unbelievable building stuff. tanks and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, and that's t- to their credit. Okay. You've got to keep people interested. Right. You got to try new stuff. You got to be innovative and, you know, and, and, um, you know, one of the key kind of transition points, you know, that kind of still kept to the original thing was, you know, uh, basically fast three. Although if you kind of go in the f- multiverse of fast and furious, that actually takes place later, like with fast six. Yes. Yeah. So, but that was Tokyo drift. Yes. And that was also, you know, basically you know, talk about Craig Lieberman being the car wrangler. Well, in with Tokyo drift, Dennis McCarthy, right. who's kind of since then has been the car wrangler, car builder, yeah. you know, cause now they're building their own cars. They're not necessarily, they're, they're grabbing in some stuff here and yeah. there, especially like muscle cars with, you know, Steve Strope's cars. But yeah, for the most part, it's, it's, they're building some, Hey, I got an idea. Let's build it. And, let's do it. And Dennis is that guy. Yeah. Dennis is that guy to say, yeah, we want to put a, uh, you know, super motor into a 67 Mustang. He's the guy, mm-hmm. you know, but what I love about that is, is that they've been stretching that 
all the time. Yeah. You know, because no one puts a super motor in a Mustang until you see the movie. <laughs> movie because yeah. that would have been blasphemy. You would have been like, "There's no, no, nope, nope, yeah, not doing that, yeah. not doing that." And you know, here we go, Dennis, to say, "Why not?" Mm-hmm. You know. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, and so Tokyo Drift, obviously, that was you know 2006. Formula D had already kind of been established. You know, drifting was. It's you know, hey, if Fast One was, we're capitalized on street racing. You know, Tokyo Drift capitalized obviously on on drifting, right? You know, and there was some you know pretty iconic cars that 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 popped up in that, and then obviously kind of the ending, diesel Vin Diesel coming in and a Charger. Okay, now we're back to the original crew, and you know, Fast just just took off from there. Yeah, but also too, what I love about Fast One too is, it goes back to the real street race where you had the import guys showing up trying to knock off the old muscle, mm-hmm. right? Well, that's, yeah, the, that 67 Mustang. Exactly. You know, that was in Tokyo Drift. Right. There's a Mustang. There's a Mustang <laughs> in it. Not only that, I mean, let's just go back Dom's Charger, you know? Or, yeah. uh, you know, what's the other guy, too? Um, I forgot which fast this one is. It might be four, but the time where Big Red, the Big Red Camaro's in there, and I don't remember the... Yeah, the, yeah. the guy, when he says American, or American muscle beats import every time mm-hmm. until... Obviously, the import car goes around it. Yeah. So what I like about it, they kept that rivalry. They kept yeah. that where the older guys didn't like the import guys. There was a, there was a tension, mm-hmm. you know, and it made a good storyline. Well, and, and yeah, and it made a good storyline. And, and we talk about Dom of having, you know, he had an RX-7, he had this and that, right? You know, but he kind of they kind of put him on the the you know muscle car path. Well, that was true to also to the import world where yeah, your dad had a muscle yes. car. You maybe inherited that. You were into imports and stuff like that. So, like, right. there's mixing it up. There's a little bit, you know, kind of the crossover. Um, but, you know, if we look at the influence that, you know, Fast and Furious series had, that obviously jump-started a lot. I remember, you know, I was going into college, you know, when that came out. Right. And, you know, a lot of my friends then started to get, you know, one guy had an Acura Integra. One guy had that fifth-gen, you know, Civic hatchback, yeah. you know, with – he had gold wheels on it. It was purple. You know, we called it Barney, <laughs> you know, had a little gold manual shifter sure. and stuff in there. But um, funny thing is, is of course, you know, we're talking when Tokyo Drift came out. Well, we wanted to drift. Yep. But it was a front wheel drive car. Oh, that's right. So one thing we, we would do uh, in the on the weekends, you know, we lived in the dorms and, and uh, there was a Panda Express and we would take the trays from Panda Express, throw them under the rear wheels, go out in the parking lot where nobody was because it was a weekend on a college. Right. And we would drift on trays until we burned through the tray. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so, you know, we were having fun with it. And, and you know, you look at that time, too, is, is you know, Toyota kind of on the, a lot of the, on the success of, of what, you know, was being seen out there is they introduced Scion to try right. to appeal to the younger crowd, you know, that was into, you know, customizing and, and economical cars. They, they saw the handwriting on the raw wall big, big time. Because again, to remember that American Honda and Scion at the time were a baseball's throw away from each other. Yeah. So for them to look across the street and say, wow, Honda's killing it with these little compact cars. Mm-hmm. And I mean, yeah. Okay. Toyota had the MK4 Supra. Yeah. Well, I mean, let, let's not try to ignore no, that. But they exist. Hey, but, let's, we're going to make that's, now that, a brand that is just directed towards well, this market. A Supra was a $40,000 car at the time, right? Yeah. Honda car. Yeah, that was their higher <laughs> end their of high the end something. sports car. Yeah. And they and they were still looking at the the Nissan thing. They were still looking at build a str- build a sports car cuz Americans love sports cars. Yeah. But they didn't realize that that groundswell of these younger kids are like, I don't I can't afford that. I don't want yeah. that. I want this styling. Well, and that's I think too was is really key is that okay, yeah, there was a lot of the street racing going on, but the the styling, the show aspect of it, you know, where Okay, maybe the horsepower didn't matter as right. much, but all of the styling, you know, was was very popular and, yeah. and 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 key, and that's really where Scion kind of, you know, they offered you from the dealership, you could buy not just you know some floor mats or right. you know some you know mud flaps or a you know win- windshield cover that said Ford on it. Right, you could buy a body kit, you could yeah. buy a shifter, you could buy all these accessories. Right, you know, for those, and you know, like anything. Things get overdone. Totally. You know, like we said, the shopping cart wings, those got bigger. Yeah. You know, obviously, you know, you had shows the, like Pimp My Ride. Right. Trick It Out. That was actually hosted by RJ. Yeah, that's right. You know, that kind of took things a little bit crazy, but it was just showing this is what the popularity of yeah. it is. And, you know, they're just having fun with it. Right. Um, what's funny is, you know, 
we talked earlier about Volkswagen and that's, that's a whole nother vein yeah. that kind of integrated a little bit, but you know, they actually had a marketing campaign called unpimp your auto <laughs> at that time where they had, you know, the, the, uh, almost Zoolander like, Oh, absolutely. Cause it was a American actor right. that was doing a German kind of accent. Um, but it was with, yeah, the GTI, you know, Mark five and their whole campaign was it, and he looked at it, and it was sleek, yeah, nice, clean, German, a, a German <laughs> styling. Yeah, he was yeah. in a white, you know, kind of coat, and it was in a hanger. You know, it was yeah. that. And then they had some kid with gold earrings and huge baggy pants, and he had a yellow car with a big old wing and body kit on yeah. it, and it was making fun of him, right? You know, and that's okay. Hey, well, where are we going to win in yeah. this? Well, let's go that way, right? You know, and, and a lot of the the you know, you talk about, you know, the sport compact car world versus the import car world. Sure. You know, a lot of those guys, yeah, drew their influence from Germany or even from the mini truck guys at the time. They did. You know, mini truck and magazine even introduced, they'd have your mascot car. Yeah. In each episode, each, each issue. Right. You know, they were a truck magazine, but they recognized the styling of some of the, you know, maybe the Ford Escorts or the, you know, the Golfs or, or certain cars that were being you know, built in a little bit more of a sleeker, cleaner style, but with a little bit of the influence from the import world. Well, and also too, I mean, let's think back to what were people putting on those cars back then? I mean, you had your fart can exhaust, which mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm dating myself, sorry, but you had a large open exhaust that was... Yeah. Well, no, and that's the thing too, like, yeah. You, you, Four inch exhaust on a 1.6 liter car doesn't yeah, really do much, it, right? But I mean, that, that was... just sticking out. No, yeah, that was, that was that, popular. Yeah, that was... You know, you had, you, you lowered it. So mm-hmm. you had your iBox Springs. Yeah. You put some type of body kit on it somewhere. Mm-hmm. You know, either if you did the full body kit or if you did maybe just a wing or a front, you know, fascia. Spoiler, yeah. You know, that kind of thing. That, that was very popular. Um, you had to take all of your interior out because you're reducing weight. Yeah. Right? So that was another big yeah, thing. Yeah, so you're just, putting just either Recaro or, yeah. or well, bride seats. But just or... one seat. Right. If, if it's a race car, <laughs> um, which none of them were, um, you know, but then also, too, you, you had special wheels that you, that you didn't put American racing wheels on it. No, you, you, you got wheels imported from somewhere. Yeah. So you, you got them either. BBS Japan, or, yeah. yeah. You know, you're looking at either a Japan model, a German model, mm-hmm. uh, some type of European. Because yeah, the racing inspired kind of the mesh mesh style it, it, wheels. Totally. Your honeycomb yeah. mesh, you know, type thing. Yeah. Um, you know, but that, then also, too, you know, a lot of the kind of other styling that was a little bit, I'd say probably more from the mini truck world started to come into that where you had like your niche, you know, wheels on there, your big Chrome yeah. kind of, you know, is more of the style. Well, and even too, we've got guys that crossed over. I mean, the, the first guy that comes to my mind that crossed over is, you know, Sean Carlson. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he was he a mini was truck guy, mini truck guy, yeah. built a lot of beautiful mini trucks and was a hell of a fabricator. And, you know, all of a sudden he gets this opportunity through uh, Ford Special uh, Vehicles um, Division where they actually gave him, uh, well, they gave him a, a car for a dollar, but they gave him this Ford Focus for a dollar and said, what would you do with it? Mm-hmm. And Sean was like, oh, my God, what can't I do to yeah. it? You know, <laughs> I mean, he built I a would... full chass- tube chassis yeah. race car out of a I Ford mean, it, Focus. it had a Ford badge on it. That was about I, it. Exactly, yeah. yeah, yeah. But, you know, and, and unfortunately, Sean, you know, passed away from, from illness, not from any type of accident or anything, mm-hmm. but um, he was one, like, I want to say the first kind of crossover guy. Well, and that's the thing too, is like, yeah, we we're talking about how, you know, if you want to go drag racing and you're an import guy, you had to go to the outskirts of yeah. LA. You couldn't yeah. hang out at Pomona or anything no. like that, you know, uh, and Anchor wasn't having that, but Anchor slowly started to accept. They had to. The import, right. you know, class and import cars into, into the, Drag racing and world. guys like Abel y- Ibarra mm-hmm. was kind of really the first driving force to try to open that up. I want to say maybe Chris Kubo might have been the first guy that won an NHRA event. Uh, so Chris Chris Ratto, okay, won the first NHRA import. Sorry, winner, and that yes. was in 1999. 1999. So this, yeah, so we're talking just prior to Fast and Furious, right? That kind of um, era of it. Um, but and that's the thing too. Yeah, you, you know you. But we had guys that were bringing out their own, you know, sanctioning. Like we had the Import Racing Association. We yeah. had the National Import Racing Association. You know, those were, were promoters that were, and I believe, you know, Frank Choi was at least one of the founders of those. But, mm-hmm. you know, that was because NHRA had a, a, a blockade against these guys. Yeah. You know, so how, so how does Sean Carlson that, well, that car was built in 2000. But, you know, how do you show up with something like that that's a beautiful 
pretty much it's a funny car more or less well, it's I mean, a pro it's stock is pro what stock, that would be yeah. right but uh, you know a pro stock ford focus that you cannot drive it on the street mm-hmm. and you go you show up to an nhra event which it passes every bit of tech oh yeah and they told him no just nope take it home yeah you're not invited what's here the, what's the difference yeah yeah <laughs> and what's the difference yeah. you know well, this one's got four cylinders and a turbo and that one's got you know a v8 what's the difference yeah. Ever, you know but no nope, it's a car you're out of here so they had to create their own niche and they mm-hmm. did it so well because they brought everybody to them they brought hollywood showed up because of that you know and yeah we know the fast and furious is a 10 minute drag race you know that should be a 10 second drag race <laughs> but <laughs> or that's hollywood. The, i think it was fast four the, the, the airport scene when oh that's i think yeah, they shift ridiculous. 10 times yeah yeah that's ridiculous <laughs> you know um but other things too like think about this nos which i hated to call it that it was always nitrous oxide yeah right but nos was a brand nos yeah. was a brand well yeah. at the time but it was from hollywood you know because they also yeah you got nos you got, the, yeah but the lingo all they, they yeah. had to come up with a lingo the so whole that was 10 easy. second car right became a right thing. exactly yeah because yeah. we laughed at that too like craig's car wasn't a 10 second car so when Dom says to him, <laughs> what was it? How many? Uh, that was 11 second car. It was like, he ran it was like a little slower. It ran like 11 forties. But I mean, that was so funny yeah. about it. Like, you know, all of us are going like, that's not a 10 second car, but the rest of the country didn't know that. Right. So to them, they're like, well, 10 seconds. Well, 10 fast. seconds a lot. Sounds a lot better but than 11, 11 seconds. seconds. Right. Yeah. Right. Got a little nicer ring. To <laughs> yeah. It. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. You know, but that, that was, again, life was imitating art. Then mm-hmm. I love the fact that Rob Cohen allowed them to do what they wanted to, and they didn't screw up the movie they made it a, a true car movie. And if yeah. you kind of look back to it too, I, I, you know, I've grown up around car movies all my entire life. And to me, that kind of thing was, well, you look at, yeah. Gen- certain generations have bullet. Yeah, exactly. Or they have, you know, Corvette summer, American graffiti, you know, something, there's right. always some kind of thing that will influence a lot of people. And they'll look back to, well, okay, obviously, you know, fast and furious, you know, was that, um, well, the other thing that fast and furious really did, which I love is it reignited because, 2000 wasn't a good time for Japanese sports cars. By then, the Z car was pretty worn out mm-hmm. because it was still the 300Z, that one that looks yeah. like kind of like a wasn't weird shoe. It was the 350Z shoe. that really right. capitalized on that. And that was, you know, talking about the timing of that, and that was, you know, heavily featured in Tokyo Drift. Yes. You know, and, you know, we're t- kind of shifting from shifting gears <laughs> uh-huh. eight times. Right. Uh, from, you know, street racing, drag racing, you know, obviously now at that time, okay, now there's some legitimate import drag racing happening. Yes. You know, alongside all the, you know, NHRA stuff. Yeah. Um, the 350Z is still extremely popular in the yeah. drift world today. Oh, yeah. You know, a lot of guys are even putting, you know, doing LS swaps. Oh, yeah. Into those. Oh, that's, you know? yeah. And because it's, it's got really good styling still, you know, to this day. it It's still a comfortable car you can, you know, drive around in. Plenty of companies, you know, have, have done stuff for it. Right. Um, it's actually what they call a square car because the, the track width and the wheelbase are very similar to almost a square. Mm. So it lends into handling very well. Well, and that's, yeah, and that's one of the things too with, you know, especially with drifting is there's kind of, it has its own set of parts and set of, you know, things that you're trying to accomplish with it versus, you know, you're street racing or drag racing, you're how fast can I get to the end of the line? Right. Obviously with drifting, there's a lot more style to it. You know, you're, you're judged on, you know, the speed. No, and with drifting kind of, it has its own, you know, set of uh, parts or, you know, things that you're trying to accomplish versus street racing where you're just trying to go in a, a straight line. Oh yeah. You know, they're, they're judged off of a little bit more of the style, you know, obviously the speed, you know, how fluid they are coming around. And especially when you do, you know, tandems and stuff like either depending on what series it is, you're either, you either have to try to emulate and match yes the, you know, guy that you're following right. you know, and stay in how close can you be to him? Yeah. You know, obviously you're not supposed to overtake or, or spin out, you know, you'll lose points on that. Right. But, you know, it's, it's kind of all about how controlled can you throw the car around a corner? Right. Um, you know, so, you know, looking at the, obviously these are real uh, drive cars. Um, but also, um, you know, they would allow if it was an all wheel drive car, like a Subaru or something like that, as long as it was converted to rear wheel drive, yeah. you know, c- compete. Um, so in the back, you know, you'd have a, a limited slip, you know, or, or a spooled if, or obviously you're on a budget you can just weld, weld it up, up the gears. Yeah. you know, um, obviously you got have a really strong clutch, you know, um, and then y- your steering angle was very important. 
Yeah. Um, so either you have an extended control arms or what we'll call like an angle kit. Yeah. You know, that would help basically, you know, you're able to counter steer way more than you would on a factory, you know, Absolutely. type of a car. And that way you have your control, you know, being able to, to go through the corners. Um, and what they also kind of would do on, you know, you'd have wide wheels, obviously, because you want still some of the traction, you know, you know, going through it. Um, but they would use a lot smaller, narrower tires. They would stretch them because you wanted a rigid sidewall. Yeah. Because that would help kind of keep you through the corner. Whereas, yeah, if you have a sidewall that's going to flex on you, it's going to it's going to well stop and it'll spin you out. Not only that, having the right, let's just say the right size tire for rim, you're entering a lot of lateral movement. Yeah. So you're going to the, flex. The tire will actually roll over Yeah. where what they want to do with that, with the stretch is they wanted to have the horsepower to actually get the tire to start to spin easier. Mm -hmm. So you've got a harder sidewall that if it's in a corner, it is going to break loose quicker. Yeah. So you're not going to have to feel that like kind of washy feeling. You're going to feel like, okay, I'm set. Yeah. I've got it's it. control. You know what's happening. Right. Every, right. It yeah. gives you the right kind of feedback that you mm -hmm. went from that tire rather than like, hey, is this thing going to fold over on me and catch traction? And then, you know, <laughs> I'm going to spin out. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, having that stretch made a big sense. But see, that also too lent to how now stance came about. No. And that's, you know, it's, it's even funny, like one of the, the key kind of, um, you know, websites, you know, Stance Nation there. On their website, it says form over function. Absolutely. You know, yeah. and that's what it came from. Like, you know, like hot rod guys with chopping and channeling. Yeah. You know, to, for lower, better aerodynamics. Well, stance guys, you know, on the street, they, they started taking that stretch tire, you know, the camber from the angle kits or right. the extended control arms. And, and, okay, well, how can we just overdo it, honestly? Yeah. You know, and, and that's the thing. Obviously, things get overdone and go crazy. It's, you know. Uh, so a lot of them would, yeah. How wide of a tire a wheel can I fit? So obviously I got to stretch the tire. Yeah. I, you know, camber it in cause it's still got to be as low as possible. So yeah. it's still got to tuck. Right. Um, and that basically kind of came the, the stance look. Yeah. Um, you know, and of course there's a lot that can go wrong with there's, that. And there's, <laughs> like you mentioned, there's always an extreme to this. Yeah. So you will see a guy that's got, you know, uh, the rear tire set at, 20 or 30 degrees of negative camber and you know, yeah. is riding on maybe only a quarter of the yeah. tire. So your, your handling is not going to be there. Yeah. Your obviously your tire wear is completely out the window. And right. now you're putting, you know, the weight of the car on that one corner of a wheel wall and, and your beads being stretched. Yeah. So yeah, you can pop a bead, right. You know, obviously like that. Um, but I mean, obviously there's people that are going to do it right. You know, they kind of look for that style and we'll do it tastefully. Yeah. Um, you know, especially too, you talk about, you know, air suspension, you know, obviously that got huge within the truck world. Right. You know, but obviously the import guys, you know, look it's, to that too, because, yeah. you know, companies like, you know, airlift or universal air, you can just replace a strut right. with a strut bag. It's actually even kind of a lot easier. Yeah. Than, it's like you a know, bolt in yeah. kind of a deal. It's almost a replacement. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's based on, because like you mentioned, most of these cars, they, they adopted the Mephirics and strut very early on. Yeah. You know, so being a front wheel drive car makes a lot more sense, uh, especially having, you know, a sideways front wheel drive car. You're, you're not going to have the room for a, a double A arm coil spring type suspension. So the McPherson strut being the, that kind of package lends to that car so much, you know, better than anything else. Mm -hmm. Plus, too, then you can also add strut bars to these things uh, that, you know, and decreases the amount of flex in those cars. So yeah. they actually help them handle. Mm -hmm. um, well, and great that's, idea. Yeah. You're talking about kind of the, the, the strut bars. Um, you know, obviously we touched earlier on, on kind of the JDM style, you know, being able to kind of have something unique that you wouldn't be able to get in America, um, you know, and at that time you couldn't bring the car over, but a lot of people would throw the, the badges on it or convert it, try to kind of upgrade it to it. But the performance and the handling wasn't always there because, you know, we look at some of the things like the, you know, the WRX, well, like the STI, the, the the strut mounts were reinforced. Yeah. You know, obviously this is more performance, more racing oriented. Well, your regular old Impreza wasn't that. Right. So it was, you know, a little bit fake in the, fake in the funk, but you know, that kind of comes with the territory. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, but talking about like kind of the air suspension, you know, the stance style stuff, kind of what kind of eventually kind of came out of that was, you know, what we call the VIP style. There you go. Um, you know, like we mentioned earlier with Lexus, Acura, you know, Toyota, um, 
they always had in Japan, like obviously you got to have your luxury cars, yeah. you know, or your, your state's cars, your, you know, for your corporations, you know, stuff like that. Executive car. Or whatever yeah. Executive car. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. That's what I was looking for. You know, um, you know, you're not going to pull up to pick up some executive <laughs> at the airport in a Honda Civic no. hatchback. You right. Know, you got to have something yeah. nice for it. And uh, what's interesting with the VIP style, a lot of that, you know, with the customizing of the VIP, because obviously what's funny is, is, a lot of that kind of came from the the yakuza yes. and the street gangs, the bozozoku guys in Japan, where yeah, they were the younger, flashier guys, but they're in suits, you know. Obviously, but they've got the tattoos underneath, you know, to kind of show that they're an, the, an outlaw. Well, they're going to do their cars to kind of represent that. Why not? If Tupac can get away with it, why can't they get away <laughs> with it, right? I mean, I, I'm sure that was the mentality of like, look at you know these these stars and entertainers that are driving mm-hmm. around Mercedes and yeah. you know, this big luxury car. It's about, yeah, it was about big, showing off big body bins sitting on wheels. Right. Yeah. You about know, showing off being a little bit flashy, right. you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they kind of started to, you know, exact that style. And, and also too, it, it kind of was a little bit of a necessity because in the nineties, the, in the nineties, you know, the police were really cracking down on street racers. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the same thing that we saw in the U S where, you know, I specifically remember being at a restaurant like in Fullerton mm-hmm. and there was a, like a checkpoint and basically a crackdown. And if, if you're driving, not even a done up, you know, import car, if you're right. driving a stock Acura Integra, right. It didn't matter if you're a 40 year old lady. Yeah. You were getting pulled over. And if you had anything modified on it, you were going on a tow truck. Are you listening there? Uh, sideshow and takeover people well actually california did is introducing a law where they can now permanently take your car if it's you know in a takeover or a sideshow um which then that the takeover sideshow stuff kind of came from street racing it did came from the drifting you know or, or what was called like hooning yes you know and the interesting thing with like hooning you know that we associate that with hoonigans with ken block um, you know, you go back to kind of, you know, 15, 10 years ago with the first Jim Connor video series, right. you know, he was in a Subaru. Yeah. He wasn't in a Ford Mustang, Mm-mm. you know, or a truck. He was, or in even a his Ford Focus or a Ford Focus. That's yeah. Right. It was before his deal with, with Ford, he mm-hmm. had to deal with Subaru. That's right. And, you know, the whole, you know, kind of Jim Connor stuff came from something that was happening in, in Japan and happening in overseas right. where it was like kind of a, a mix of autocrossed and drifting. Right. You know, so you had like a little race course, you had to do certain things, but then, you know, you had to maybe do a 360 around this corner Yeah, or you had to do a J turn. You had to, you know, drift around, you know, this thing and it was still timed, but you had to do these specific tasks in order to complete it. And that's kind of took that, style and they tried to do it here a little bit in the states you right. know like x games i remember had a jim con thing yeah. didn't really catch on because they, they, they but i think it's because they try to play that off as rally racing yeah rally remember that was like a the big more, thing you know yeah, ken, ken and like you know travis pastrana they were kind yeah. of tanner faust you tanner know faust, he was yeah, a, yeah. A, an early drift champion right you know, still does drift racing, but then he got did a lot of rally yeah. stuff. And Reese Millen too. I mean, Reese Millen mm-hmm. was you know waving the flag for years on that deal, even though he's you know from New Zealand, but he's been you yeah. know stateside for for many years. So yeah, you know he was waving the flag for the Americans as the American driver. Yeah, you know, no, and that's yeah. You talk about American drivers. You know, you, Chris Forsberg. It's true. You know, obviously, a little bit later, you know, Von Gittin Jr. Yeah, you know, was probably one of the more well known you know persons in that that drift world now. Um, and even from Europe, you know, Sammy Hubinet. Yeah. You know, and, and they even crossed over a little bit with the Ken Block and the Jim Connor stuff. Exactly. And, and, and I, I mean, I'm surprised drifting isn't more popular. It, I mean, it's become kind of a, it's its own yeah. solid motorsport. Right. You know, within talking about, you know, drag racing. And you know, we look at LS Fest, you know, mm-hmm. like Holly's, you know, deal. And obviously it's got to have an LS engine in it, but they're still drifting a lot of the import cars. Right. Um, they would shut down the autocross course and then bring in the drift cars. Right. It's kind of, you know, become its own part of the culture and it's, it's its own entity separate from, you know, street racing right. as well. And I also think too, you know, let's also go back to the early two thousands when fast came out, you know, Japanese car manufacturers at the time had totally switched gears into the economy 
sell units. Just mm -hmm. here's well, your Toyota Honda Civic, Corolla, your Toyota Corolla, your Nissan Sentra. Or Camry, Toyota Camry became well, yeah. like the most sold car in the, right. in the country. So, so the, the manufacturers, they knew they were making money on the commuter cars, mm -hmm. and they really kind of turned away from the sports cars, but they knew that the culture was still looking at the sports cars. Yeah. Obviously, the movies, you couldn't ignore the movies. You couldn't ignore the, what was going on in, in you know the, the news, the magazine. Like you mentioned, the, the police cracking down. So the car companies, they, they had to reintroduce. And I think that one of the first things that really mattered was is that, you know, Japanese imports, like you're talking about these gray market cars would come over, mm -hmm. you know, uh, nobody over here knew what a Skyline was or a GTR. That yeah. was ridiculous. You know, that was something like, well, I've never seen that car before, you know, that, and that's a Nissan. I thought they were Datsuns, mm -hmm. you know, so that, that kind of made, you know, uh, things kind of sp spark up. So yeah. here we go. Nissan brings over the GT. Well, Fast and the Furious showed everybody what a Skyline was. Yeah. Right. So, of course, it gets popular enough that now Nissan has to come out with a car. Yeah. So, of course. Well, and that's, yeah, obviously the 350Z was very popular with Nissan. Right. They want to step it up a little bit. And so, yeah, I believe it was in, in 2007. They, they bring you know, the GTR. The, the GTR came over. Right. Um, and that's the thing. You know, you, we talk about the, the GTR. Yeah. It, it's a legit supercar, muscle car. I mean, it's it's yeah. in the same category yeah. as those. It's it's. It's a little bit outside of the import, you know. It's not your regular compact yeah, car, right? It's it's know, purpose it's built. It's four or five hundred horsepower. Yeah, yeah. In that, you know, and all wheel drive, and all wheel drive, yeah. right? So, and, and and the GTR did it showed people that hey, Japan still knows how to build a muscle car, mm -hmm. you know, because now we're at that time when the GTR came out, we're looking at Camaros are are, are still are being talked about. The Mustangs hugely popular. Um, you know, even Chrysler is starting to look into more things. So, you know, that's kind of where I think that it, it gave time for them to shine. Now, Toyota and, and, and Honda, they didn't really follow suit at first. You know, to Toyota stuck with, I'm selling Camrys. Yeah. Well, we they had the Scion. And they had, and that's it. yeah, they had the Scion version. But, you know, that ended up going away, I believe, in like 2014 or 2016. Right, right. Um, you know, and then... But yeah, they they kind of eventually started to kind of capitalize on the old, you know, time because you look at now and, and we talk about we've talked about this with the trucks. Um, whatever someone in their forties what they had or wanted to have in high school, yeah, is going to come back around, right? And what's really cool now is is seeing you still see high school kids or kids in their young twenties that have a three fifty Z or an old civic or, or something else. And they're doing all the, the stuff to it. And you got guys that are now looking back at either a throwback style or they want, yeah. you know, their inspiration is coming from the import world. I ran into RJ not too long ago mm -hmm. and he's driving a Honda Accord. He's that's got a, he's got a 22 <laughs> Honda Accord that's lowered on iBox. And I'm like, yeah. dude, like, Apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And he's like, I got to have my daily. And yeah. he's right. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. some of these guys, I mean, yeah, uh, same way. Of course, I'd love to have a, you know, 68 Chevy truck I can drive every day. Right. But I can't drive that every single day, but I still no. have one. Yeah. You know, um, so I, I think that. But your daily is probably a truck or something it's similar. It's something very similar. Right. I, I, I'm that's not what you're into. I'm not driving a Honda Accord. No. Right? And that's, yeah, it's not your style. It's not, it's not my style. You know, but, and that's what's cool is that, you know, you saw, you know, Obviously, with with Scion, you know they had the the FRS, which was kind of a kind of a funny thing because it's basically same as a Subaru, yeah, uh, same as like a couple other cars, yeah. Well, it's but that Boxster style yeah. flat motor, yep. you know. That's why you know the the, the FRX or whatever they call yeah, it, FRS, yeah, IFS, yeah, IFF, yeah, yeah. So, um, but yeah, and then but that kind of was got a little bit popular, but then that kind of led to okay, Toyota's going to bring the Super back, right? And because as I said, like, it's, it's kind of funny, you know, 2005, you know, GM, Chrysler, Ford, they bring out an SSR, an HHR, the right. retro Mustang, you know, all that, you know, kind of stuff where, okay, we're going to capitalize on the nostalgia of the baby boomers. Exactly. You know, where you look now, okay, the super came back. Right. You know, Nissan, obviously the 350Z turned into the 370 you know, 380, all that kind of stuff. Well, now they're, they just, you know, launched the Z. 
Yeah. So basically they're looking back to the styling of the fair lady. Yeah. You know, looking back towards the early years of the Z, their, their own heritage. Rightfully so. And that's kind of helping to usher in, you know, more modern era of the yeah. import cars. Why not? They've got the pedigree for it. I mean, you know, again, we go back to Nissan being a, a huge giant in the sports car world and multiple manufacturer championships, national championships for mm-hmm. many drivers. I mean, they're, they're kind of, you start to kind of look at Ford and Chevy's uh, heritage. You can almost mirror the same thing with Nissan. Yeah. You know, that they, they've really done a lot that that's, that's, also driven their cars to, you know, the reason the vehicles we have today are because of they raced on, you know, again, they raced on Sunday, sold on Monday. They no, did the same thing. Yeah, it's the same kind of thing, you know, and, and obviously maybe some of the other import companies kind of shifted around that or got in a little bit later or took their own angle to it. Right. Um, but that's, yeah, it still inspires, you know, the, the, the aftermarket still does inspire, you know, what the factory is making. You know, and Definitely. that's what you look at the styling of the GTR that comes factory from Nissan. Right. And yeah, it looks like someone put a body kit on it or, yeah. you know, put their styling on it or obviously the, the high horsepower on you it. You know, the, the only complaint I really have about this, I have a beef with Honda. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I have a beef with Honda is they have the gift. And, and this is, I actually asked it, one of their representatives one time, I said, you guys have the gift of, you have the aftermarket world that loves your cars. You have the younger generation that in, has embraced their cars and will continue to embrace their cars through their middle age. Because again, like you said, the guy that's 40 still wants to think that he's 18. Yeah. So Honda, why would you try to stray away from that and make your cars more difficult to, to you know, because again, too, you look at a, a, a Honda car right now. Like, let's look at a Honda Civic. Well, they have their SI version that is like their yeah. top or their Type R, mm-hmm. and it's a pretty nice car and it's pretty quick for what it is, but it's very expensive for what it is. The, I think the uniqueness of the Honda Civic was here's an entry level car yeah. that the aftermarket makes a ton of parts for. Here you go, kids, go. Where Honda now is looking at it like, well, hey, we inter- engineered this car and we know that we can put these items on it because they're, they've are they been proven by the aftermarket. But we're going to make it a little bit more difficult for you guys to do that because we're going to make the car a little more expensive. And we're going to also do that same Honda approved parts where they're going to sell a cold air intake or they're going to sell yeah. their exhaust system. You know? Well, and that's, yeah, it's kind of a... Like, I think like we're losing ground. Well, I mean, you, you probably ask one of them and they would say, no, we're not, we're doing right. We're doing it the right way. Right. You know, we're offering the parts, but you also got to then look at it as okay. So that wing or that, you know, cold air intake or bumper probably was, you know, they were developing that for two years cause they yeah. got to go through X, Y, Z and exactly. it's got to go committee and testing and all this stuff. Whereas yeah, an aftermarket company could R and D a kit, boom, throw it out there, mass, you know, a month or so or right. whatever you're, you're to market with it. Um, but yeah, that's, it's just a different approach to do it. And you know, it's where do you want to sell the car and make it, make it popular with people that want to customize it and you'll, they still have to buy the car. They still got to buy the car. Right. Yeah. Or are you going to want to do all the customizing yourself and, or, or the options yourself? Right. But then it comes to, okay, well now I'm limited on what I can do to it. Yeah. And using only your parts right. that are probably twice as expensive. They, and they are. And easily available to everybody else. Right. Or I can kind of more, you know, with the aftermarket, you can kind of, you can pick and choose. You can do carbon fiber hood. Right. You can do a, you know, bumper from another, you know, company. You yeah. Know, uh, you can kind of go however you want with it. Well, the answer... When I proposed that question to a Honda representative, the answer was, you guys are 1% of our market. So, and that, that is true. You know, why am I going to, why are we going to do all this stuff for you guys? They're only buying 1% of our cars. Yeah. You know, I still got a, I got to still a few million cars this year. Well, and I think too, that's maybe why a little bit Honda has been still a little bit more considered a, a general commuter it is. car. It is, right. Um, you know, more for the masses that are just driving their car. They're, yeah. The only time they're going to do anything to it is maybe throw a, a seat cover on it yeah. or maybe wheels, right. you know, or just go get the oil change. Yeah, and, and, and of course, they have an answer. They can if, For the guy that says, why can't my Civic be cool? They'll say, the Type R, sir. Mm-hmm. You know, so they, they think they've checked all the boxes off. What they've 
forgot about is is that we're car enthusiasts. So no, we want to make it unique. We want to make, make it to it ours. Creative. We want to be yeah. creative. We want to say, look at what I've done with your car. Yeah. It, it, rather than saying, look what I bought. Yeah. You know, the look what I look, bought. Look what options I checked yeah. off on the yeah, list. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Look what I bought as a GTR. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a look what I bought. I bought no, this GTR. No, and that's the thing. Like, kind of, yeah, yeah, you can do some <laughs> right? stuff to it, but yeah. you're like, all right, but you don't, they did it right. You don't sit there and go, look what I bought. I bought this Honda Civic. You yeah. don't get the same result. Well, and that's the thing, too. You know, we're talking about the GTR kind of coming back, you know, or being introduced, the the more styling of the Supra and, you know, the, uh, you know, Z kind of cars. Well, yeah. Yeah. Honda or Acura kind of tried to capitalize on that. They brought the NSX That's back. right. But for the most part, like nobody really. Well, COVID killed that car. It, yeah, it, timing it probably wasn't yeah. wasn't right. Yeah, you know, wasn't kind of there. But. Because they, they they were ready to launch that thing, and that was. I mean, I, I remember even Jerry Seinfeld was like their spokesperson for it, and mm-hmm. they were looking to launch that as we're bringing back the NSX. We're bringing. We're going to go after the GTRs. We're going after the Supras. COVID hit. Yeah, and they've never recovered from it because to them they're like, well, we don't have any orders for them because no one saw the car. No, it, you know, it, it didn't it, really. It, yeah, it, get it, out like, there they as didn't. Much. They didn't put it out there to say like, "Hey, this is coming. Just wait." Yeah. They just said, "Oh, you know, no one really cares about it anymore." So, the thing I think is going to be crazy about it is because they did produce some cars. Mm-hmm. So think of how rare those cars are. True. You know. No, and that's the thing too. We might you know see a little bit, you know, in a couple of years, and might get a little bit more you know, popular or more desirable, or they might kind of revisit it. Right. But. And we'll see too. I mean, remember the American market drives that too. The C8 Corvette coming out was a big deal. Mm-hmm. I mean, GT forties, you could buy a GT 40, you know, so supercars are still something that American public want to buy. Yeah. Um, and, and, and probably with the, the C8 Corvette, it's not a $134,000 yeah, yeah. car. It's a seventy thousand dollar car your base model right yeah you yeah know, so yeah. 70 to hundred thousand right. versus okay you're getting a ferrari or lamborghini you're spending six figures no matter what in that exactly you know, so maybe if if with the nsx they can kind of capitalize on that where I think so. make a little bit more affordable supercar ish mm-hmm. you know or in right. that same vein and that's i think too that's where nissan hit it out of the park with the gtr because yeah it it beat porsche in the nurberg Right. You know, it beat them on their home turf. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it's faster than a Porsche around and, that ring. And I can tell you, too, a friend of mine is the chief principal at uh, uh, Vassar Sullivan Racing that's actually sponsored by Lexus. Mm-hmm. And I can give you firsthand uh, information right there. Lexus has just signed them up for another three-year contract, and they're bringing them a new car. So Lexus is looking at obviously expanding their IF line mm-hmm. is what they're looking for. Yeah. But right now, I mean, Vassar Sullivan's killing it right now. They're the GT two class is pretty much dominated by them. And those are Lexus developed engines. Mm-hmm. They're not like they didn't go out and buy someone else's deal. Yeah. And, I mean, Put they developed it yeah. and that's something that they want to develop into an actual factory car. So we're still doing this. We're, yeah. we're still developing. Well, and that's the thing too, you know, it's funny looking at it is there's, probably more of the import cars actually manufactured in the u.s right than detroit style cars. oh 100 percent. yeah because yeah toyota obviously they moved to to texas a few years ago yeah um but yeah they're north toyota north america their plants are in the u.s my forerunner was built in texas exactly you know whereas my chevy was built in canada yeah right (laughs) you know or you got ford that's having a lot down in, in mexico so i think you know it was, it was tough kind of getting into the market, but they found their niche. They did. And, you know, were able to kind of capitalize on on a generation that had something that they could attach to. Um, and kind of now import, the import, custom import scene, import racing, drag, you know, drifting, and kind of the import cars were kind of just now part of the pie as, yeah. as far as American cars are considered. And I look at that as... A healthy transformation because if you look at like a V8 car, you immediately think circle track, drag race. Mm -hmm. You look at import cars and you look at so many other things that they've opened up. Yeah. You know? Um, and again, I, I do go back to right now the the takeover kids and, and the and the guys that are doing side shows. A, a lot of those guys are you know with the Chargers or with your you know Challengers and yeah. your American cars, but also a lot of the the import cars. Dude, Infinity into that. Yeah, those that four door. It's like a G thirty seven or something like mm-hmm. that. I see more of those things than I see American cars out yeah. there. You know, so I I, I I and I I do like what's going on. I just wish it was a little bit more organized. You know, to, to, for these guys to be taking over a lot of these city streets, it's just going to end up being bad well, for all of us. Yeah, and that's because it's 
for that, it's, you know, versus the street racing where it was about the racing, you know, and, and beating the yeah. guy. It's with the takeovers, a lot of it has kind of become how dangerous can we be? Right, right. You know, where it's 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 a badge of honor to crash it or it's a badge of honor to touch, tap to a tap, car. Yeah. You know, tap a car when it's coming around. Yeah. Um, so, and that and that's, you know, I think with that, the police have targeted a little bit more of the American cars, you know, with right. the, Dodge, the Dodge Chargers and the Challengers, because those are kind of bigger, yeah. you know, flashier and stuff. Um, but it's it's kind of the same story where it's it's underground. Mm-hmm. It's a little bit of the outlaw, same as the street racing and yeah. dr- drifting, and it's going to maybe come into its own, and we've already kind of started to see that. Um, but I think, you know, to kind of wrap this up, it you know, the, the import car world is kind of don't really have to call it imports anymore. No. Because it's, like I said, it's kind of become its own segment of the market and, it, and legitimately so. Yeah.